You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Gelt will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. We are talking with Ken Rogoff, who's a professor of economics at Harvard and former chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. Ken, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. A pleasure to speak with you, Doug. I should certainly mention in the introduction that not only are you an economist, but you are an avid chess player, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end to talk about that. But I'd like to talk for a minute about your, your recent book called This Time is Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. And the, the title, This Time is Different, suggests it's really just a play on the fact that this time isn't any different when we see uh, the growth and the, the crash of any economy. You know, you argue that throughout history, rich and poor countries have been lending and borrowing and crashing and recovering, and there's nothing new under the sun. If that's true, is there something that we could look at from history right now and find a really good investment? <laughs> a really good investment. Now you ask me a really tough question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think you can learn a lot from history about uh, what the trajectory of financial crises looks like because there's an amazing commonality over time, over history, over legal systems, over political systems. And economists uh, hadn't really done that very much in recent years because there'd been so much interest in technical mathematical models and looking at historical data is very rewarding. There are certainly investors over the financial crisis who've looked at historical data and claimed to have done very, very well by it. But I can't tell if that's really the data or just innate genius. So when you're talking about trends that, that repeat themselves through history, are these so incredibly macroeconomic that you can't make any real practical decisions based on them? Well, I think they're very important practical decisions, which is that when an economy has been booming for a long time and a lot of it's driven by credit and borrowing, that you need to beware both uh, as a politician, as a regulator, but also as an investor. That you know, I live in the United States and home prices went up 100% over five years uh, in the early 2000s. And, you know, people, there was just a frenzy. I, I even had professor friends who invested all their retirement savings in buying a few homes, figuring that was just, you know, a big way to make money. A lot of people did that. You know, you can say the same thing about the tech boom. And it's, uh, you know, it's, you need to be a little bit careful about those things. There's a, a real tendency for small investors to sort of jump on the bandwagon when they see something uh, going up a lot and to jump off when they see it going down a lot. And needless to say, they often suffer versus professional investors. Okay, first of all, I agree with that. That's been my experience in, in real life. I'm an investment advisor. And, and even now we're finding that uh, I find clients come in and say, hey, Doug, I just heard of this great deal in a decrepit town in America, which is about to boom, and they'll give you great deals at the bank to borrow. And then I have to tell them exactly what you said. But even the professional investors or the economists, let's look, for example, at the United States government itself, which seems to use debt um, so vigorously to to uh, to make sure that it continues growing. And there are economists, you know, Paul Krugman himself, who keeps talking about the the import the the ability of that debt to help save the economy. Is this just misguided? Well. It's a question of uh, balance. So you know, the United States has been borrowing like a fiend. We have doubled our debt in the last few years. And the interest rates we pay are still very low. I mean, in part, you know, as somebody, you know, said, we're like the healthiest horse at the glue factory. I mean, <laughs> we look better than a lot of the other countries. But I think, I think it's actually very misguided to think that it's a free lunch and you just keep borrowing and you don't worry. One of the things Carmen and I find, Carmen Reinhardt, my wonderful co-author, and I find in our research is that you can have these periods where the government borrows a lot and debt gets very high. And it's often followed for decades by slow growth. 
because of course eventually you have to adjust. So I, I think it's there is a this time is different. That's the title of our book mentality to this. Oh, everyone wants to lend to the United States. Let's just borrow till we're blue in the face. I mean, we're borrowing a lot. And I think a sober thing would be to sort of gradually try to wind it down and not double up as Paul sometimes suggests. Okay, so practically, now let's put on our, our realistic glasses here. It sounds very reasonable what you're saying, but I'm not sure that's really the direction we're going. What would be a reasonable guess that w what would happen if the U.S. continues to borrow? Oh, I don't think there's any question that if we continued to borrow at this pace, the day of reckoning would come when financial markets would put pressure on us and we'd be forced to adjust uh, fairly sharply, maybe not like a Greece. I think the United States would have time to raise taxes, time to lower government spending, but there's no question that eventually you'd be forced to adjust. And th th nobody exactly knows where the ceiling is, uh, but we do know that it's very, very rare air to be getting up at the kind of debt to income ratios that the United States has already hit and where it seems to be heading. So it's, it's sort of a question of taking out insurance. I mean, you could just keep borrowing and it's better today, but there's this risk that the you know ultimate problem is going to come sooner rather than later. And that's why I think you have to be a little bit cautious. I, has, I, I want to add, nobody knows. I mean, we can look at history, the world changes, nobody knows. But that is the essence of this, this time is different theory that Carmen and I advance, where people just every time it sounds like it's too good to be true, people think up some story why it's too good to be true. And inevitably, there's a bust. A country goes bankrupt, a financial system cracks up. It doesn't happen every day, it doesn't happen every decade. But if you look over 800 years the way we did, it happens an amazing amount of the time. It's happened an amazing number of times. Mm -hmm. We are talking with Ken Rogoff, a professor at Harvard, a, uh, a former chief economist at the International Monetary Fund, the author of a book, a co-author of called This Time is Different, which looked at 800 years of financial folly. Ken, I want to touch on something which you said, which is that you could perhaps continue to do this borrowing for a long time if we are realistic about the fact that politicians' goal tends to be re-election. And if they can constantly borrow and make things better you know, for the next few years, why would they possibly have any motivation to stop this borrowing? <laughs> well, you've asked the $20 trillion question, Doug. <laughs> and I mean, I, th I think it's very hard. I, I talk to people in the United States and they all say, I'm really worried about the deficit. I'm really worried. And the government's printing money. And then you ask, well, would you like to have higher taxes? No. You know, how about the government, you know, cut some of these programs or trim Social Security? No, you know, they don't want to hear about it. And if you're a politician and you come in and say something about austerity, say something about trying to tighten your belt, you get your head chopped off. It's probably the case that it's only when markets really begin to push back that you see something. And boy, if interest rates started rising on U.S. debt, it would just be incredible how it would affect our budget because... You know, every 1% is like $150 billion. But uh, it is true that countries like Germany, the United States, Great Britain that have a better long-term track record have a political dynamic where at least the discussion of doing something starts earlier. I mean, there, well, there are other they had countries. Crisis. We just didn't have the same crisis in the United States yet. Yeah, but, you know, they, a, a lot of it, the more advanced countries have gotten in a pattern where they prophylactically do something. They make smaller adjustments along the way. It's part of being an advanced country. And in emerging markets, the political resistance is greater. They have more trouble doing it. Most countries just lurch from being bankrupt, you know, once every few decades to having it happen again or even more often. And these countries that have been really successful, like the United States, have some built-in self-control mechanisms in the political dialogue. I don't want to overstate it, mm -hmm. but there is, I do think you'll see some adjustment. It may not be enough. Okay, so you're talking in terms of decades. Your book looked in terms of centuries. And interestingly, your book came out in 2009, just around the time when this whole thing was uh, unraveling. Was that by design or by chance? It, it was chance. 
we uh, worked on the book for seven years, first of all. We, of course, when we started it, we thought it would take us a year, and then we thought it would take us two years. But we worked on financial crises our whole lives. That's what we do as scholars. It is a scholarly book. And we got this idea that it would be possible, thanks to the internet and other new ways of getting data, that we could put together a data set on economic history, the likes of which had never been done, to be able to study financial crises. And that's really what gripped us. It wasn't, oh my gosh, there's about to be a financial crisis in the US, we've got to write a book about it. We were writing a book about all financial crises. And what's been sort of amazing about this one is that how much the United States crisis, Britain's crisis, Europe's crisis has fit these previous patterns, which we laid down quantitatively in our book. That's a big innovation of our book is to look at them not just as what did the finance minister think, what did the president think, but to look at hard data to the extent we could find it. So are there any practical lessons that in today's market a small investor could walk away with? Well, I think one thing to take note of is that we're not likely to see a booming global economy for a long time. I mean, these things take a long time to work themselves out. Uh, you know, it's, it, I think we'll be lucky if uh, we have uh, even mild growth for a sustained period in the advanced countries. I mean, well, well, I mean, I think that's maybe the most likely scenario, but it could be worse. So we're, we're in a situation where I must say it's not very easy to be a small investor. Uh, most of the major countries pay practically zero interest rates. And if you lend at longer term, you get a little bit, but you don't know if it's going to get inflated away. The stock market could be stagnant for a long time. Uh, housing, you know, might not, you know, do well. It hasn't. It's not an easy time to invest. If I had to pick something, I would say real things like land, housing, commodities. These have done better during these more stagnant times historically. Okay, that sounds practical. Ken, we're nearing the end of our time, but I just want to touch on something from your history, which is that many years ago you were a chess player. You were quite a, a phenomenal chess player at that on the on the tournament circuit. Do you find that the experiences you had or the, the thought processes that you had in playing chess have helped you in your career as an economist? Well, I think they have. I mean, it's very indirect. But first of all, uh, it's very helpful in some of the work I've done where I think about the economy from a strategic perspective instead of looking at like an engineer. I My maybe best known early work was on why you should have an independent central bank and why that had strategic advantages within the economy also in international monetary policy. But certainly when I was at the International Monetary Fund as chief economist, it was very useful using chess analogies in my head about interacting and negotiations, about how other people uh, think. And then lastly, I'd say it teaches you how to perform under stress. You may not think of chess as stressful, but <laughs> oh, believe man, me, oh, competitive man. chess, very, very stressful. And so after that, nothing seems stressful to me. And I have found that. <laughs> helpful at times. I think the only thing more stressful than playing in a tournament is watching your children play in a tournament and saying, <laughs> oh, please do that, please do that. <laughs> All right. Maybe so. All right. We have been talking with Ken Rogoff, a professor at Harvard University, former chief economist at the International Monetary Fund, uh, fabulous chess player, and the author of This Time is Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. Ken, in the last couple of seconds, just tell people, how can they follow your work? I'm not hard to find. Uh, you can look me up at Harvard University, and I have a website giving my popular writings as well as my academic writings and other information you'd probably never want to know. <laughs> All right. Ken Rogoff, thanks very much for your time. My pleasure. You've been listening to The Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.